Hello guys, very nice that you came and today's theme is circulatory shock. And this is a crucial thing for today. So, so circulatory shock. It is a lethal question and uh, not only for you, but also for the patients later. So please really try to concentrate. Okay. And so circulatory shock, a uh, flight plan. What is the flight plan? flight plan flight plan so first we're gonna go through some terms and maybe some of you if you watch other videos you already know the term so then please don't talk I want the people who didn't saw the videos and thus basically know only physiology to try to play with me the game and try to find out what could that be to define the terms okay so first terms very important ones. Then we're going to define shock. Define what is shock. Okay. Then we're going to go through types of shock. Then we're going to go through phases of shock. And the last one, we're going to do a table, which is going to compare some of the shocks we're going to talk about today. And sort of it will give you the main idea. And maybe this is the point where you will start to understand the thing. So the table is very important. Okay. So, and let's get to terms. So what are the terms? Terms. And first... The, the most important one, and we, you already heard it from me, but let's do it again, is ischemia. And play, play the game with me. So ischemia is one term. Then there is another term, and th that is, and we're going to, I want you to find for me and think of what are the activators, activators of stress reaction reaction and I want the the ones which are are the changes of the homeostasis that will always turn on the the stress reaction so that means inner activators from the body signals from the body okay then I want you to tell me what is preload very fast then I want you to tell me what is what are JVP, CVP, PCWP, cardiac output, and systemic vascular resistance. Okay, and then we're going to have afterload. Okay. So if I will start now. So uh, first of all, what is ischemia? Can you tell me what is ischemia? How would you define ischemia? It's uh, um, low delivery of oxygen to the tissues. No. Okay. So you make me very happy because it's not exact. You are right that the problem is uh, decreased oxygen as well, but that is not fully correct. By definition, okay, why? By, uh, uh, lack of blood yeah, so, so the reason is decreased blood supply. But watch out, there's a difference between hypoxia versus ischemia. And now you were only mentioning hypoxia. Uh, hypoxia is only about decreased levels of oxygen. Okay, that's, that's it. But ischemia is something else. There are more things to it. Because if the cause is decreased perfusion, that means that there will be, yes, the tissue is somehow metabolically active and it, it consumes things. And it's dependent typically on 
blood supply. And if the blood supply decreases, then not only oxygen is decreased in the tissue because cells are working all the time and they, they need continuous supply. But what else? What, what other things are decreased? Oxygen and also nutrients. And not only nutrients, but also if the tissue is washed, not enough, it's slower, s slowly washed, it's slow. So the tissue is not getting rid of waste products. Okay, so on one side, there is in the tissue, there's oxygen. You can mention that because oxygen is crucial in this case, but also glucose and other ones. And wh what builds up over there? CO2, lactate, okay, pH goes down, etc. And uh, K plus increases also. Okay, so, so you see ischemia, the chemia of the tissue is distorted. Okay, and maybe we talked about it, but the ones who didn't hear it, what is a acute ischemia of the heart, of the heart muscle? What do you call that? No, okay, and thank you again, because it's not totally correct. If you want to be pure in this definition, it is not. Because ischemia, basically you take ischemia as a reversible thing. Okay, because your tissues are in ischemia all the time. Your muscles are ischemic all the time if you run, etc. Okay, it depends, of course. Or if you just compress something somewhere, you know, if you compress artery for a while, then the tissue gets ischemic. So it's a reversible thing to a certain point. So what's infarction then? Tell me. Myocardial infarction. If we talk about heart, what is that? Some like part of the... Part of the heart uh, stops being well supplied by oxygen. Well, that would be ischemia of the of the the heart, yeah. But like if it, but yeah. necrosis, very good. So in watch out. There's a difference between ischemia and infarction because infarction means necrosis, and ne necrosis is a general term. It's a very general term. Necrosis. And there are many causes of necrosis, chemical, electrical, radiation, mechanical. In case the necrosis is due to prolonged ischemia, then you call it infarction. You can use the term infarction for ischemic necrosis. That is crucial. Okay. So basically, where, in what tissue I can have ischemia? In any tissue which is blood dependent okay so i can have ischemia of gut muscles whatever i'm striated or smooth liver kidneys heart brain okay i don't i won't have ischemia of nails or or enamel okay but if the tissue is and the, the, its cells are blood dependent Sooner or later, later, I can have ischemia over there, okay? And the same accounts for infarction. Any tissue that can have ischemia, if the ischemia goes longer, and it always depends on the metabolic rate of the cells of the tissue. And the cells which are very much oxygen and glucose dependent, they will die earlier. And when they die, and it, it needs to be a mass of cells, like thousands of cells, then I, if one cell dies, which happens all the time when tissue is in ischemia, you don't care. You don't call it necrosis. But when a certain region dies and bursts, and of course, apoptosis goes there as well, depends. But uh, necrosis is the, the major thing. So then you call it infarction. Okay? Yeah? So you can have infarction of heart, but also infarction of brain or infarction of liver. Or muscles, okay? But, uh, okay, uh, in, in, in normal population, if you say infarction, they always mean heart, mainly, okay? But it's not correct because they, sh they should say I'm having 
myocardial infarction because the same accounts for stroke. I'm having brain infarction. That's a stroke. Okay. There are other types of stroke in, in concerning brain. There is also hemorrhagic, but it has a this this let's say necrotic uh, place due to ischemia as well over there. Yeah. And brain is a bit special also with signs. So forget brain for today, but in, in the peripheral tissues, it's just like this, okay? And what is the main sign of infarction in a healthy person in a way, except the infarction? That means his neurological, uh, let's say, uh, and sensational qualities are okay. What's the main thing typically? If you're having ischemia, how will you know I'm having ischemia over there? It's pain. That's the crucial thing. It's the pain. And you know why there is a pain? Because accumulates lactic acid. Yeah, yeah. So, so changes of pH, if there is a decrease in a tissue, if there is a decreased pH or increased um, potassium, whatever, there are free nerve endings and they already sense this and send a signal, painful signal, hey, there's something going on over here. You should check it out. So, because this is the only command you will like really take seriously pain. Okay. But of course there are people with full neuropathy, etc., and they don't sense it sometimes as you get older, it gets worse. Okay. But the same accounts for infarction. You have just the same pain because the root is just the same and the trigger is just the same. It's the ischemia that triggers the pain or decreased pH or whatever. Okay. And that's why with pain sensation, it's a visceral pain. If we talk about, for example, heart and you cannot tell if this pain is due to only ischemia or am I at the beginning, then you can basically see it that if the pain disappears fast, it was rather ischemic pain. But if it continues, it's maybe already necrosis. Okay. Yeah. But we don't have time for this uh, today. So there's a difference between hypoxia, decreased only O2, ischemia, it has the hypoxia in it. Okay. And then there is infarction. That's already necrosis. Okay. And the infarction appears just, it's dependent on the, the cells, how much they, they are able to survive without a perfusion. And a striated muscle cell will survive much, much, much longer than a heart, heart cell in a way. And definitely much, 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 much longer than a CNS cell. Okay. Neurons. They, they survive really the, the lowest uh, time in a way. Okay. Yeah. So it's always, it depend it depends on the tissue, how, uh, how, how much the energy is needed to, for survival. Okay. Of the tissue. So, so there is hypoxia, ischemia, infarction, and what else? There's also, also a term called hypoxemia, but uh, this only talks about what? Hypoxemia, sorry. Hypoxemia. Low blood levels just in the blood? Yes. So it just describes oxygen in the blood, partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. Okay. And if it's decreased, you call it hypoxemia. Okay. That's it. Nothing more. So you got hypoxemia, hypoxia, ischemia, and infarction. Okay. And by the way, we have no more time, but a question. So what will you call clinically, what term you will use for ischemic attack of the myocardial cells of the myocardium? What, what will you call it clinically? It's not infraction, it's? It's angina pectoris, okay, yep. It's angina pectoris, please. That's the ischemic attack of the heart. But it also tells you there is no necrosis yet. That's important. So attack of angina means there was ischemia, but whoa, good. 
it didn't go to necrosis yet. Okay. And basically, you have analogies with this everywhere. The brain is exception. It won't hurt the ischemia of brain because it has no free free nerve endings. It's a central nervous system. But how will how can you tell there is ischemia of brain or necrosis of brain? You will tell it immediately in case person is not sleeping, because then immediately he will lose the function. And it depends just where it happens. If it happens in motoric cortex, on the left side, I'm going to have right-sided hemiplegia or hemiparesis. If it's sensory, I won't feel it. If it's in occipital cortex, I will have vision problems. If it's frontal one, I will have personality problems. Okay? I will be acting weird and uh, whatever. Yeah? So, so with brain, it's special. And... The function, the, the, the impaired function will just tell you where's the problem. That's why neurology is great to diagnose the place where where is the problem. Uh, but it's a bit worse with curing the problem, okay, in neurology. Anyways, so, so you understand the terms, very crucial ones. So let's get farther. So activators of stress reaction. So this was one. I'm sorry. So this was answer to one. Let's get to answer to two. What are activators of stress reaction? And I mean those three hippos. I'm calling them hippos, but they are hypos. And these are changes of homeostasis. That means decreases in the blood that will always trigger stress reaction. Always. And which one, which one are they? So some hypo, hypo. Where you get... Hypovolemia, very good. So hypovolemia, hypovolemia. And today, it's a day of hypovolemia, by the way. Circulatory shock is about hypovolemia. So this one is especially crucial for today. But then there are th two other ones, like definitely. So hypo, what will be lacking in the blood and always trigger? Hypoxia. And can you correct yourself now? Because we just talked about the term hypoxia. Very good. Very good. And what about third one? What about hypotension? Well, that's hypovolemia in a way. That's the yeah. same. Hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia. Very good. So you are right. Yes. Hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia. So remember when you will see someone and you'll be in hypoglycemia, you'll see how the stress response will trigger and you're going to be sweating and you're going to be pale like like a wall, you know. So 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 these three will always trigger stress reaction. And what is important, remember still for today and forever uh, that every time you're in a stress reaction and we talked about it already as well. There's a release of a hormone from hypothalamus. Always. Which one it is? ADH is always released when you are in stress. Always. And ADH does what? I will remind you again. It does resorption of water and urea, please. Never forget that. But today, the water matters. Okay? So, ADH triggers resorption of water and urea and also helps vasoconstriction a lot but in really high levels okay because the original term is vasopressin okay so first they found out it constricts the vessels later they found out it retains water okay so that's uh adh and i want to bit remind you something out of stress reaction and that is remember in case you are in stress reaction, just a stress now, I tell you, you're, you're doing pathology in, in one week, you're going to be stressed. And basically, in fighting and whatever, like normal stress, you're, if you're scared, you're going to turn on the fight or flight reaction. And in this case, the peripheral tissues are not well perfused. The perfusion is decreased. It's controlled by sympathetic trunk. But remember, it's fight or flight. So if it's a normal stress reaction, 
your muscles will be well perfused to fight or flight. And we'll talk about this later in phases of shock and I will, I will tell you a small difference over there, okay? So, but remember that. So, so muscles are rather well perfused because you wanna run. So that was, uh, th those were the activators of the inner, uh, let's say the inner activators of the stress reaction. And let's get to preload. So what is preload? Preload basically means, and it's such a complicated definition, and we want, it's those are mathematical formulas, and uh, everyone like it's very complicated. It's not so simple, but I will simplify it. Basically, preload, or basically, what I want you to understand is when preload is increased and decreased, and it always depends what side of the heart it is. So you basically should talk about right heart or left heart. But basically, what does it mean? Is preload will be always increased when there is lots of blood coming or staying in the heart. And it will be always decreased when there is less blood coming into the ventricles, I mean, okay? So if there is less blood there getting there, then preload is decreased, very simple. What is, uh, what is JVP, jugulary venous pressure? Please, it's just the same as CVP actually. But G JVP is not so precise. CVP means that you put a catheter into the central uh, vein, central vein somewhere. And remember that uh, basically, if you would measure the the vein pressure in the periphery, there's like ten tors, ten to fifteen tors. But as you go with the sensor more and more towards the right atrium, it's basically zero. It should be just a bit above zero. Okay, normally. Okay, yep. So that central venous pressure. And of course, when it increases, for example, when your right heart fails, okay? Yep. And that's the same for JVP, it's just the same. But with JVP, you're looking rather for the filling of the uh, jugulary veins, okay? So you, you, you look at it and they're filled. There's a special setup. You have to put the patient in 45 degrees. You check the neck and if it's filled, you know there's something wrong. The blood stagnates in front of the heart, in front of the right heart. And there's something with the right heart. Okay. PCWP, crucial. That's pulmonary capillary vag pressure. Okay. PCWP. And this is a special, special pressure. And it used to be used a lot. You use a Swan Gans catheter for this. By the way, Gans was uh, working in Nikem over here in, in Prague, and then he emigrated to the US. And uh, it's a floating catheter. And what you do with that, you put it into the central vein and you let it flow. You just push it inside and inside. And it goes and goes and goes and floats and floats and gets into the right atrium, then floats through the valves to the right ventricle, and then floats to the pulmonary ar artery and to its branches. And then you veg it. You push it as far as you can, and then you block one of the one of the branches of the pulmonary artery. So basically, if I will. If I will draw the right heart, and over here, that, that's the pulmonary artery. I will, I will put it like this, that this is a branch somewhere in, in the lungs, yeah? In the lungs. And basically what you're going to do, you, you put the catheter and then you go, 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 boom. You block it over here. But the cool thing about the catheter, if we go macro over here, here. Then you would see a balloon at the almost tip of the thing. And here's a pressure sensor. So basically you plug it into the, into the branch of the pulmonary artery and you expand the balloon over here. You expand the balloon. And what happens now? If you expand the balloon, you turn off the pressure, which is before the balloon. And the pressure normalizes through capillaries with what? Perfusion. With what? The pressure equals what? Left atrium. 
So basically, thanks to PCWP, or nowadays, they rather, because uh, no one understood the, the term, so now rather they use the term pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, but it's the same. With this, you can measure pressures in the left atrium. And you know what? Guess what? If the pressure in left atrium increases, what you know? That the left heart is failing. Okay? So it's very useful... Uh, information in a way to check the pressures in the left heart but of course it's very dangerous in a way so so nowadays there are other procedures how you can do it maybe to use a echo but still it's 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 done don't worry it's done if you want to be correct then it's done okay then yeah so remember pcwp tells you pressures in the left atrium that the left heart is failing or there's something with the uh, mitral valve or whatever, and there's regurgitation or stenosis, it's going to be increased. Okay? So that's PCWP. What is cardiac output? Cardiac output is it's, it's not a pressure. So cardiac output is what? It's the amount of blood you're able to push with the heart in one minute. So it means a stroke volume which is about 70 mils for in average, times the beat, which is 70. So if you're not doing anything, it's about 4,900, 4, so five liters, okay? So that's cardiac output, okay? Good. And so, so that's cardiac output. And what is, uh, so basically it's, I'm gonna write it here, 70 milliliters times 70 in case you're resting, and it should be about five liters. And, and what is SVR, systemic vascular resistance? That means it's systemic. So over here, it means that if it's increased, that there is a vasoconstriction of the arteries. And if there is vasodilation, it's decreased, okay? And look at afterload. What is afterload? Uh, so is it's, it's the force, force basically that the heart, the heart has to uh, endure in order for the blood to be ejected from the um, ventricle into from the left ventricle into the aorta. So very, very good. So, so afterload is a basically the resistance against the the left or right heart. It depends for what I mean for on what heart you're looking for has to work against. To work to be functioning so basically if you increase afterload if afterload is increased which is typically for the left heart increase when when the systemic yes. vascular resistance is increased when there is a sympathetic tone increased and there is vasoconstriction you're gonna have increased afterload so basically uh, when pressure in aorta increases you're gonna have increased afterload of the left heart and the same with pulmonary artery if you're going to have pulmonary embolism you're going to have increased afterload for the right heart and it's not good for the heart because it needs to work more it consumes it needs more oxygen it needs more glucose and it's more likely to get ischemic and later infarction okay yep good so that's afterload and basically, those are the terms I wanted to mention before we start. Okay? Good. So, thanks for watching. And don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. And as always, check the description below for supplementary questions and other materials.